This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the Ledger Nano hardware wallet. Half peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more and use the offer code EB09 at checkout to get 10% off your first order. And by CoinCap.io. With over 500 altcoin exchange rates updated in real time, CoinCap is the authority for cryptocurrency market information. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with John McDonald. He's the CEO of BitNet and he has a long history of working in the payments industry. He was at Visa and he was also the head of business development at CyberSource, which we'll talk about a bit later. So he's sort of a deep from the payment space and uh, they're sort of, they run a Bitcoin payment processor. So thanks so much for coming on today, John. Yeah, my pleasure, Brian. Thanks, Sebastian. So it's actually, it's kind of funny that we've been doing this podcast for a long time and payments is always one of the first things that come to mind when people talk about Bitcoin. But this is the first time we actually have a sort of a, a pure payments episode and someone on who's really focusing on that. We have had, I guess, people talk on mittances, exchanges, all kinds of things. But um, so can you tell us a bit maybe about online payments in general? Because I think a lot of people in the Bitcoin space actually don't know that much about how payments really work. OK, sure. Yeah. And it's it's uh, something that uh, you know our the, the founding team of, of BitNet comes from the online payments industry, uh, so we know a great deal about uh, the you know how broken, frankly, online payments has become uh, as the internet has enabled um, merchants to market and sell their goods and services globally. Uh, payments has not kept pace. Okay, the infrastructure for transmitting funds and accepting payments. Um, uh, has is, is continues to be based on, you know, 1950s era card swipe technology. So uh, we see Bitcoin as a, uh, a, a probably the biggest innovation in fintech since the introduction of electronic payments. Okay, going back to uh, the magnetic stripe card and, and, and Visa. Um, so I guess probably a little bit of background about where we came from. Uh, my co-founder, Stephen McNamara, our CTO, uh, and myself were at CyberSource, uh, which is a company founded in the mid-90s at the advent of the commercial internet, uh, which was created to help merchants accept payments, at the time primarily credit cards, uh, online. And something that the CyberSource founder, a uh, fellow named Bill McKiernan, who is uh, actually an investor in BitNet, and he's the chairman of our board, uh, founded CyberSource um, out of frustration, frankly, with his efforts to sell at the time software. So, you know, Bill looked at the internet and said, "This is awesome. Okay, well, what can we sell over this over this global network?" Uh, and software came to mind. Okay, it was a digital product that could be downloaded, uh, so there was no need to you know ship a physical good. And so, I created a company called Software.net. But what they quickly ran into was collecting. On that, on those, uh, the, the license payments for software was a disaster. Uh, people quickly uh, caught on to the ability to defraud merchants uh, by filling out fake, uh, fake credit card numbers that would appear to be legitimate, but otherwise, when they were processed, would, would turn out to be false or, or, or stolen. And um, so, you know, Bill looked at this and and solved it by creating a payment gateway with some real time fraud control systems. Uh, something that's important to note. That in the in the credit card world, okay. First off, it's a pull payment. You're you're presenting a credential to a merchant, uh, or uh, more specifically, to the merchant's processor. Uh, that merchant's processor then uses those credentials to pull payment from the card issuing bank. The card issuing bank maintains the account, the relationship with the consumer. Uh, so there are multiple steps, including a card network in the middle that connects the processing bank for the merchant with the issuing bank uh, on behalf of the consumer. Uh, the card network establishes the rules, including the collection of interchange, which is the fees paid from the merchant acquiring processor to the card issuing bank. 
uh, on behalf of, of, of the card issuer. Um, and under the network rules, under the so-called operating regulations established by Visa and MasterCard, the merchant in an online transaction, in a so-called card not present transaction, uh, is liable for the fraud. So it's the reverse of a physical retail brick and mortar transaction where you hand your card. Uh, it's, you know, in, in most places, it's now chip and pin. You insert your card, you put your pin in to authenticate yourself as the card holder. Uh, in some places like the US, it still remains a, a signature based where you swipe the card and you sign. But if, if in, under the card regulations, if that card is not physically captured, in other words, if the chip is not interrogated by a point of sale terminal, or, or the, the magnetic stripe card is not swiped in the track two data interrogated to compare with the, the signature and the other authentication, then the merchant is held liable for fraud. So which applies to any use of a credit card through a mobile phone or through a PC over the internet. So uh, there is a tremendous cost associated with accepting cards online above the interchange, which is for card not present higher 50 to 100 basis points, so a full 1% higher for card not present transactions as compared to physical retail location transactions. So merchants, A, are paying higher rates to accept credit cards online. B, they're exposed to the fraud so that if, if the card transaction is later found to be fraudulent or even just disputed, the merchant is at risk of losing the entire value of that transaction. So it goes from the added sort of half a percent 1% additional cost of accepting the card, suddenly it's 100% of the cost of the transaction. Okay, in those examples where a merchant is, is found to have accepted a bad card for a transaction, they have lost the entire value of the goods or the services that they sold in exchange for that bad, that, that, uh, that fraudulent card. Um, even if they're successful in defending a dispute, a so called chargeback uh, that's initiated by the cardholder, uh, it's still an expense. It still requires overhead. It requires resources. Um, and we've done some math, okay, to try to come up with the total cost of acceptance, which starts with the interchange. And then other fees are layered on, the card network fees, uh, the acquiring processor fees. Sometimes there's an ISO, a so-called independent service organization. Um, there are PCI costs associated with accepting cards. Uh, the costs that are needed to pay outside consultants to audit retail systems for security, okay, to make sure that there aren't any unintended uh, uh, backdoors for breaches where card numbers can be stolen, uh, which unfortunately happens with increasing frequency. Uh, and that's, that's the other thing. You know, the criminal rings are becoming very, very sophisticated. Uh, they're becoming incredibly organized and professional. Uh, and so it's an escalating problem. So when we add up the total cost of acceptance, it's, it's not the sort of 200 to 400 basis points, 2 to 4%. It's really 8 to 10 to 12%, depending on the industry. So if you're a retailer and you're accepting cards, uh, that's really what you're paying. The fully loaded cost of accepting cards online is in the neighborhood of 10%, which uh, is an incredibly corrosive cost okay, to the margins, especially in some, some thin margin uh, businesses. Um, and, and in some industries, such as airlines, you're specifically, uh, or I should say particularly and disproportionately hampered by the cost of acceptance because of the nature of the high value uh, of the ticket and, and the delay in providing the service. So if you're, if you're a card acquiring bank, you're a bank that is basically accepting cards on behalf of airlines, uh, you, to mitigate your risk, at any point in time, we're holding on to 10, 20, sometimes 30% of the airline's cash flow as a protection against this whole chargeback uh, process that I just described and against the fraud. Uh, people, unfortunately, airlines are, are particular targets for these, for these crime rings to resell stolen credit cards that have been obtained through breaches of retailer and processor systems. And we're talking millions, millions and millions of cards at any particular time are for sale on the black market, uh, on the internet. And, and again, you know, these, these criminal rings are becoming incredibly professional and sophisticated at marketing these cards and gaming the fraud control systems that issuers have put in place. Uh, they know that if they can sell cards by zip code in the US, then the 
the the buyers, the other criminals, the buyers of these of these cards can actually create uh, counterfeit cards and go shopping within a certain radius of that zip code and go undetected for a certain period of time. Uh, and again, as a way to circumvent some of the fraud control systems that issuers have put in place. As a result of, of this increasing amount of fraud, um, there, there's been um, a hair trigger okay, put on these fraud control systems. And, and, and as a net result, otherwise legitimate card transactions are being declined. So in other words, if you're a card holder and you're presenting your card, it's your card, you've authenticated yourself, but because it's an online transaction and because say you're in Europe and you're buying an airline ticket on a carrier in Asia, or you, know, you cross borders and you go outside your particular buying zone, uh, issuers increasingly are declining those transactions and we call those false positives. So here again is another cost uh, to merchants of, of accepting cards online. It's, it's this dead weight loss of, of otherwise legitimate sales that get declined by the card networks, by the issuing banks, through no fault of the retailer. And there's a, a firm called Experian that has done some, some data analysis on, on the magnitude of that cost. It is $40 billion annually, four wow. zero billion. <laughs> That's 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 crazy. I mean, it, it it is such a complex system and one that is, like you say, it's extremely expensive. And on the merchants, I guess one exception to what you mentioned, where the merchant is liable uh, for for fraud and online uh, transactions is, is using three secure. But that's another uh, cost that the merchant has to um, has to interiorate uh, through through uh, through the you know the subscription to three secure. So no, but I mean. So, but why is it that uh, when uh, these regulations that you mentioned uh, imposed by Visa and Mastercard, why are the why are online transactions uh, different from uh, f physical transactions in the sense that merchants have to be held liable for fraud? I think you touched on it in the in the case of three D Secure. It's it's the authentication. Okay, it's the ability to physically interrogate the piece of plastic that either has a chip embedded in it or that has a magnetic stripe on the back of it, which can be, you know, read and swiped. Um, it's, it's the added risk of, of just what we described, that there could be, you know, so-called PANS, the primary account number, you know, and, and Visa MasterCard, it's, it's just a 16 digit number, which can be sold and then used in, in a, you know, in a pull credential fashion okay, to, uh, to defraud a retailer, uh, it just introduces a higher degree of risk because uh, of the lack of the ability to physically interrogate the, the payment credential in the form of a piece of plastic. Um, and there have been a lot of uh, efforts, okay, 3D Secure is a good example, uh, although again, it's an added cost, it needs to be implemented, there's a certain amount of IT overhead. Um, and, and again, we're, you know, we're, we're keenly, we at BitNet are keenly familiar with this system, okay? A, a lot of these costs that we were just describing are sources of revenue for CyberSource, okay? That was a, you know, a service layer on top of the credit card networks that was designed to help merchants handle these risks, you know, manage these costs, uh, improve the likelihood that they would collect on a card transaction. But at the end of the day, they're costs, right? They're just additional costs layered on top of the, the, you know, the existing payment system to help merchants who are trying to sell their goods online uh, from getting ripped off. So if we, if we sort of sum up the, the, what that whole payment system currently looks like for consumers, uh, sorry, sorry, for merchants, it's ex extremely frustrating because they have to bury, bear the weight and the responsibility of potential chargebacks uh, because of fraud. And for consumers, uh, they're faced with the reality that they're not able to use their credit card in certain situations where it might be considered a fraudulent uh, transaction. That's certainly happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you, Brian, as well. And, uh, and, and who's benefiting from this, say, broken system or a system that doesn't really serve merchants and consumers? Well, the banks are uh, because they're taking uh, those fees. Um, for providing that service, but that doesn't really, it's, I mean, it's, it's not a very good uh, situation when you look at it from, from a high level. No, no, it's, and it's broken. And I think that, that was the point that right. we, that was the conclusion that my co-founder and I came to while at CyberSource was 
you know, as we, I'll give you another kind of background on that. Visa in 2010 acquired CyberSource uh, for a couple of billion dollars. CyberSource was by then a publicly traded company and it had been for, for some time. And um, part of the strategy for, for Visa's acquisition was to extend the reach of CyberSource globally. Okay, so at the time we were active in Western Europe, we had a joint venture in Japan, but Visa's strategy was, you know, go to Asia, go to Singapore, go to Brazil, take this technology, and, and as e-commerce was proliferating globally, help merchants and other regions accept cards more safely online. Something that we found was that a lot of other regions were not as card-centric as Western Europe or as the United States in terms of they were using other payment types, so-called alternative payments. Uh, bank transfers, Ideal in the Netherlands is a good example. Uh, Boleto Bancario in Brazil is another good example. Uh, some places like uh, South Korea were using mobile payments. Um, and that was great. But th the point being that for a retailer now to extend your reach globally, which was the opportunity with the global internet, was to reach consumers anywhere in, on the planet with access to the internet, you had to, you were faced with the, with the prospect of integrating not just to the card systems, but now to a proliferation of other regional alternative payment types that were tied to regional bank networks or regional mobile net network operators. Okay, so they worked great in a particular country or maybe even in a particular region, but they didn't travel. And so suddenly we're looking at this as a patchwork quilt of siloed payment systems that were stuck okay, within regions, and they were tied to proprietary bank networks, et cetera. And so what we saw with Bitcoin, and this is going back to sort of the 2012, 2013 era, was uh, an incredible leap forward, okay, just an incredible development that with a single um, connection into a service provider like BitNet, a merchant could now accept a global payment type from anywhere on the planet. Anyone connected to the global public internet could spend Bitcoin and that Bitcoin could be accepted by any other merchant, okay? Independent of any bank network, any mobile network, network operator, no cross-border restrictions, no cross-border fees. And that's another cost that I should have mentioned earlier with the card networks, a so-called uh, ISA, an international service assessment, uh, is charged by the card networks anytime that there's a transaction that crosses uh, a border. Okay, again, where the, the merchant is, is in a different location uh, than the issuing bank. So with Bitcoin, right, with, you know, the Bitcoin protocol, uh, the global public internet became a secure payment network. And that caught our attention. And here we were at Visa trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to continue to serve merchants globally, or, uh, you know, to, to help them uh, uh, extend their reach to, to consumers anywhere the internet, uh, you know, could be uh, accessed which with the proliferation of mobile phones was everywhere, right? And so we saw a couple of developments uh, from you know, the expansion of, of the internet, okay, through mobile broadband, uh, the proliferation of smartphones, and, and then, then the fact that now there are billions, you know, five, six billion people now with access to the internet, uh, but no bank account, okay? And thus likely no, you know, no access to a credit card, um, so we saw the opportunity, uh, you know, uh, there, there were a couple of different important developments sort of converging, okay, and, and Bitcoin came out at a time when, you know, the, the, the global financial system was brought to its knees, frankly, okay, going back to the metadata included in the Genesis block, right, about the, the Central Bank of England bailing out RBS or whatever that was, and, you know, I, I think that we all started to question, right, you know, what what are we doing here with the financial systems? Why are we relying on central banks? Uh, why are we still relying on card networks and other proprietary bank systems to transfer money uh, with all these added costs and risks and exposures? You know, the internet is freed up information. We can now trade, you know, information. You know, providers like Skype and they enabled us to complete voice calls over the internet. We had voice over IP, which is a great technological innovation. Suddenly we were freed from you know, the landlines and the mobile roaming charges, we could use the internet to speak. Well, now with Bitcoin, we have money over IP. We have the ability to send money securely, as securely as we can send, an, uh, or as freely as we can send an email, we can now securely send money. And that was an incredible, in our estimation, innovation, and probably the single most important development in financial technology ever, okay? 
And so we felt that it justified our leaving CyberSource, our leaving Visa, to develop and launch a platform specifically tailored to enable merchants to accept Bitcoin, to, to obtain all the benefits of accepting Bitcoin, but without a lot of the risks and without a lot of the costs of having to handle the private keys, uh, you know, convert the Bitcoin back into fiat, which merchants still need, okay, to pay rent, to make payroll, uh, to pay vendors, um, and and guarantee the payout right at the transaction uh, at the uh, at the cost of the transaction uh, to the merchants. So we saw an opportunity, in effect, to create a services layer on top of the Bitcoin network to uh, to enable merchants to accept payments from anyone with a smartphone and access to uh, to the internet. Yeah, I think this is such a such a compelling compelling thing. I think like that's when one explains Bitcoin to someone. I think it's always those cases or remittances is another one that just kind of makes sense to everyone, and it's really easy to for people to then see that it's such a compelling thing. I think when we look at the realities of it, and I'm I'm curious about your opinion on that, because for a consumer that maybe insecurity of the credit card network can actually be almost a feature, right? Because it allows one to sort of claim back the payment in case something goes wrong uh, or if you're dissatisfied with the merchant, right, with this, this pull payment. Uh, and, and that's not the case with, with something like Bitcoin. So how, how do you think about the aspect of of consumer protection and, and the aspect of how it appears to the consumer in this context. Well, so, and, and we're now using um, the case where a consumer has access to a credit card, right? So, right. And, 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 and I agree that that's a, that's a frequent uh, analysis that we perform is that, you know, if you have a, a credit card um, and, you know, and despite a lot of the frustrations that we just mentioned, the fact that, you know, your card might not work, um, in fact, I ran into that twice just in the last week trying to buy uh, uh, airline tickets, okay, um, uh, trying to uh, get from Europe to the United States. Uh, I, I, won, and one, I won't name the airline, but in one particular case, uh, I had to try three or four different ways to get to, to buy a ticket on that carrier. Uh, and I, I finally had to go through a travel agency that would recognize my credit card and authorize me. That's incredibly frustrating. Right? You know those travel sites where you can buy with Bitcoin, right? Well, I tell you, that unfortunately, that, that travels. I do know those travel sites well, and, uh, and this particular uh, airline w was not uh, uh, hooked up to that travel site. But, um, but again, I mean, it, it, no, you know, all kidding aside, that is the solution, right? I mean, if 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 I were able to spend Bitcoin on that airline, I, I could have gotten thirty minutes of my life back, right? So, but we'll we'll put that aside for the time being because I know, uh, uh, Brian, what you're trying to get to is a consumer protection element of, you know, I'm now pushing cash to that airline. Okay, if that airline doesn't fly, you know, how do I get my cash back? Um, and, and that, you know, the technology exists for that today. I know that's, that's an increasing area of focus and inquiry for some regulators. I know in the, in the US, the Federal Trade Commission has just uh, begun uh, providing some guidance, some kind of consumer risk warnings. I know central banks the world over have likewise issued, you know, even if they're not regulating Bitcoin, they're, they're issuing guidance to say, uh, you know, consumer, you know, caveat emptor, you know, consumer beware, um, and, you know, guard your private keys, don't deal with uh, unscrupulous merchants, you know, et cetera. Um, but the fact is that the technology exists today to uh, enable consumer protection on any Bitcoin transaction. Um, you know, and I think it was an important enough consideration that it was uh, addressed, right, in the initial white paper and, and uh the, the whole notion of uh, you know having an intermediary uh, uh, function accomplished through a smart contract, right? Through you know multi-signature transaction, where um, the Bitcoin is subject to uh, some additional uh, conditions, okay, before it can be further transferred, um, and, and that's that's a service that we can provide today. Yeah, I, I think that's. That's a really interesting way of looking at it, right? Because one, one way of looking at consumer protection in the current card network, you could say, oh, the card networks are secure. So it's always possible the card was stolen. So as a consumer, if you call them and say like, hey, this was a fraud, this was a illegitimate payment stuff, you get your money back because they can be sure. Uh, whereas with Bitcoin, 
it's like cash, but then it does have all these programming capabilities and multi-sig and things like that. So you can sort of layer consumer protection on top of that in whatever way you want, right? Maybe sometimes you don't want it. Sometimes you want to have a third party. Sometimes maybe you want to pull data from APIs to determine uh, whether the payment's made or how. And so I think that's interesting. Of course, it's a considerable engineering effort. It's hard. It's going to be hard to coordinate and to standardize. And, and also, I think it will be hard for consumers to know what to expect, right? Because if you have different types of consumer protections in all kinds of areas, uh, one of the advantages of a credit card is that there's like one number to call and, you know, you can deal with it. If, if you have a credit card. If you have a credit card, yeah. If you don't, yeah. Well, I'm just saying that's, you know, that's an important consideration, right? When we're talking about the billions of people now, who, right, you know, right. can get online. And, but that doesn't, that doesn't eliminate the fact that, okay, those billions of people can now shop with Bitcoin, but they're still subject to, right, the, you know, uh, uh, the unscrupulous merchants who don't deliver on, on the services or, or the goods. Um, and we do think that, you know, there are near-term use cases. Uh, and we, we have a best, best practices uh, kind of, you know, turnkey solution that we can offer to retailers today to basically say, okay, this is how you handle, you know, refunds, disputes, uh, and uh, consumer protection to the extent that you want to offer the ability. Um, and, and so a good example would be a marketplace, right, where, you know, it's one thing if it's a high street name brand retailer with whom, um, you know, the consumer may have a prior relationship or, you know, to whom the, 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 the consumer is willing to place a, a, a great degree of trust in just the refund policy. Um, if it's, say, you know, you're buying, you're, you're on Etsy, you know, or even eBay or some marketplace, and you're going to purchase a, a the hypothetical used Rolex watch, right, from, from another seller, you have no connection to this seller, probably will never deal with the seller again, uh, yet you're going to push that seller digital cash. Okay, what is your recourse? Um, and in that particular s s scenario, we would say, well, you know, we could set up a, a multi-sig transaction uh, where, you know, in an automated fashion. And, and by the way, you know, these solutions exist today. You know, they're providers like Gem, you know, Bitgo, right? They're, I mean, this is not something that needs to be built. It exists, right? We're all using this technology for, you know, corporate treasury and financial controls purposes. Uh, but this could be a consumer facing service where uh, the consumer can say, okay, I'm going to spend my Bitcoin and buy this used Rolex. And I know that, you know, if that doesn't show up within five days, something happens, right? And there's a condition that's tied to a timeline that the condition expires. If the consumer, you know, receives the Rolex, inspects the Rolex, sees it's a valid Rolex, it works, et cetera, the condition expires, right? It's in some period of days. And then the Bitcoin is capable of being transferred off the blockchain sold on exchange, et cetera. Um, that, you know, that, but that, that technology, that solution exists today. But I think, Brian, to your point, you know, that's our best practice that we've kind of put piece together. It's not a standard, okay? It's not like an operating regulation necessarily being dictated by, you know, a duopolistic card network, <laughs> for instance. Um, but it, it, at the same time, it, it's, it's something that for a consumer who's concerned about their exposure uh, you know, should be sufficient, okay? If that consumer has decided they want to pay with Bitcoin, and that could be because that consumer is in, you know, Malaysia, right? Or South Korea or someplace where they don't have a credit card or the card is not going to work. You know, for some reason, that consumer has decided to pay with Bitcoin. Um, and, and there are a lot of use cases where we can, you know, explain or describe where that, that would be the case, where they would want to use a Bitcoin uh, transaction instead of a card. We can protect that transaction. We can we have the technology today to help protect that consumer, um, but it's a space we have to keep an eye on because I think that to your point, if each country regulator jumps up and and requires you know a different standard or a, a different solution, um, that could get complicated. You know, and it, it could cause consumer confusion. And any sort of uh, kind of siloed regulatory approach we have found, you know, has it carries with it the risk of disrupting the global appeal of Bitcoin, right? I mean, if it's going to work differently in one country versus another because of these kinds of regulations, that's something that we need to, to nip in the bud. And, and I think, you know, the only way really of doing that is coming up with some sort of, you know, self, uh, you know, 
uh, best practices, right, that, you know, the, the industry itself comes up with. Let's take a short break so I can take you to Paris. I dropped into La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin, in the heart of Silicon Sentier, home to many startups, including Ledger. And I spoke with Nicolas Baca, Ledger's CTO, about their recent membership in the FIDO Alliance. So the FIDO Alliance is a group of industrials dedicated to remove the use of passwords from the web. So we decide to join them because we think that Bitcoin uh, is a very close protocol, technically speaking, to FIDO and enhancing Bitcoin products with that kind of feature is very useful for everybody. So this will enable you to log on easily into websites in different ways. For example, uh, with our NFC product, you will be able to log on into a service by tapping the device on your phone or by tapping the device on an NFC reader. Uh, you will have uh, a way to authenticate without passwords in a standard way. And the standard way is really important because there have been a lot of initiatives trying to remove passwords from the web, but this will only work if they are interoperable. You don't want to lock users into single solutions. Uh, given the traction that Fido has today, uh, you have supporters like Google, like eBay, like PayPal into it. We believe that it is the, most, um, the best standard to do that. So definitely look forward to future Ledger products being FIDO certified. In the meantime, you can always count on the Ledger Nano to keep your Bitcoin safe. So don't delay in getting a secure setup today. Go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EB09 to get 10% off your first order. And that offer code is valid until September 30th of 2015. We'd like to thank Ledger for their continued support of Epicenter Bitcoin. When we talk about adoption, you mentioned... Uh... I was making the comparison to credit cards and, and you're certainly right. That may not be the best comparison because for consumers, credit cards work reasonably well. Uh, at least they seem to work reasonably well because uh, the, the costs are sort of hidden, right? They're just put on top of the price, but you don't, you don't notice it as a consumer. Um, does that mean that you guys at BitNet will focus on maybe some of those niches and markets where that's not the case and payments don't work well, like maybe gambling, some, some online things that car networks don't work with, or remittances, micropayments, uh, maybe Internet of Things, although that's probably uh, still quite far away until that's really going to become a, a big application. No, exactly right. We're looking at all those uh, use cases, and, and I think you're onto something that you know some of the areas of early adoption could well be tied to places where credit cards just are not working well today for whatever reason. Um, the you know so our, I mean our our focus is that look if it's if it's legal okay in the jurisdiction where the business is being conducted okay if it's regulated is the merchant capable of complying with those regulations um, you know it. it because you know, we analyze this a lot, and frankly, we, you know, with some of our banks, uh, the the notion of being a high risk merchant uh, in a credit card in a card acquiring scenario um, oftentimes has nothing to do with the appeal of that merchant as as a Bitcoin uh, acceptance uh, solution. So, um, in other words, again, going back to airlines, and sorry to pick on airlines, but they're a high risk merchant. They're a high risk. They're they're so called MCC, their merchant category code is high risk because they're accepting high value uh, uh, tickets or they're, they're selling high value tickets uh, well in advance of providing the service. So that leads to a lot of disputes and a lot of headaches. And under the network rules, the card acquiring banks are the ones responsible for making whole the card issuing banks, okay, on these chargebacks and these disputes and these frauds. So you know, those are, that's a great merchant category for Bitcoin, right? And you know, the airlines get their cash up front they don't have to wait for the billing cycle. They don't have hold back reserves. You know, the banks don't crimp their cash flow, the whole thing. Um, you know, gambling, sure. Okay, potentially, I, I think, you know, gambling in Europe and other places where it's it's legal, uh, in the United States, it's, it's still an issue. Um, that should be a, a great market for Bitcoin acceptance, right? It solves a lot of, of issues uh, that card acquirers deal with and chargebacks. <clears throat> but an additional consideration for Bitcoin are the regulations and, and concerns pertaining to money laundering, okay? And so online gaming, uh, unfortunately, is, is prone to high volume, you know, uh, kind of potentially anonymous uh, transactions, okay? So, you know, Bitcoin in to gambling chips, the gambling chips are, are, are bet traded, you win some, you lose some, uh, but then they're cashed out. And I think that some of the concerns 
about you know, gambling specifically uh, as a vertical pertain not to the credit risk, right, that, that typically uh, uh, is a hindrance for card acceptance, uh, but to the money laundering considerations. Uh, but again, that's manageable, right? And, and our approach is, you know, we have built a platform from the ground up with a lot of these considerations in mind about collecting the data, uh, both on the payer and on the merchant, so that we can comply with a whole panoply of, of regulatory uh, frameworks, you know, starting with the BSA, the Bank Secrecy Act, okay, you know, know your customer, anti-money laundering, uh, you know, so fo- so-called, uh, uh, you know, SDN, specifically de- designated nationals in the U.S. is known as OFAC, uh, the Office of Foreign Asset Control. And there, there are a lot of considerations that are, exist with the existing financial services, uh, existing financial systems, I should say, where typically financial institutions are on the hook for screening out money laundering and, and, and monitoring transaction uh, activity to try to spot indications uh, for potential money laundering situations, uh, activity that spikes or it's out of the ordinary, unusual, that requires further investigation. Um, you know, we're, we're a registered money services business in the U.S. Treasury under their FinCEN guidelines. Uh, we're obligated to file suspicious activity reports in all the jurisdictions you know, where we do business. So you know, these regulations don't change just because we have a global digital currency. Um, and we knew that. We know that coming from Visa and CyberSource, we understand that there are a whole host of regulations that we're going to have to be complied with. And so we built, we hardwired in from the ground up in our platform, the ability to collect the necessary data and to comply with these regulations. And, you know, we feel that that's table stakes, right, for for getting access to to, to bank systems. And for the time being, while Bitcoin is, is still really a payment type as opposed to a currency, all right, in the sense that retailers really can't use Bitcoin to pay vendors and to make payroll, um, that they're going to want fiat currency. So a big part of our service for the foreseeable future will be accepting the Bitcoin from a retailer, whether it's in you know uh, high street retailer or you know gambling or you know travel or airlines or whatever, converting that Bitcoin back into fiat currency and paying that out through the existing bank systems to have access to those existing bank systems. We have to comply with a lot of these regulations that were frankly created for financial institutions to screen out bad actors at the account level. Well, on the Bitcoin network, there are no financial institutions, right? So guess who has to do that? BitNet. So I mean, you, you touched that. Perhaps it's a good segue into my next question. Uh, what, I mean, Bitcoin, as you mentioned, uh, is, I mean, so it's an international payment system right now, but it's not used as a currency per se. And that is sort of the main role the payment processors are playing now is converting that back into fiat currency. And that has been one, uh, I guess, uh, thing that has held back adoption is that you always have to hold this currency for one reason is uh, fiat currency. One of the reasons is volatility. Do you see in the future Bitcoin as a currency or simply as a payment rail? And I guess the second part to my question is, can we assume that uh, if, if we assume that Bitcoin may become a payment rail for only high value transactions, as has been discussed, what would that mean for payments? Yeah, sure. I, I do think it will become a currency. And if we look at the sort of the last six months, the volatility really has uh, decreased dramatically, right? And the price has been trading within sort of a 200 to 300, 275 band. Uh, for several months. And, and I think that that's important, right, for establishing the confidence by consumers to hold Bitcoin for some period of time, right? And in some cases, it, it's, uh, you know, they don't trust their own sovereign currency, so it's a store of value, right? The volatility of Bitcoin might be more attractive than their, than their, um, their central bank issued sovereign currency. But I do think that given time, uh, and frankly, given, you know, the chicken and egg issue of, of, providing a place for consumers to spend Bitcoin. And that's something that BitNet is, is hyper-focused on, is the acceptance side of that equation, right? If, you know, one of the recurring questions is, well, gosh, how is Bitcoin ever going to act like a currency if consumers don't have a place to spend it? Um, and that's, that's where we come in. We're trying to make it as, as simple and as risk-free um, as possible for, for retailers to start accepting Bitcoin, which we think will be a, a big step uh, forward in 
you know, enabling consumers to to treat Bitcoin as a currency as opposed to perhaps you know a store of value or a speculative trading opportunity, right? Um, and I do believe that you know, given given situations like we have in a couple countries in South America, for instance, you know, Venezuela or Argentina, you know, now we're pointing at Greece, uh, you know, as always, um, you know, there there could very well be a situation where a central bank, I, I don't know, you know, a p- particular example that where this might happen, but a populist government takes over through some some vote on the country, um, and and just basically bins the central bank, just says, you know what, we're on our third currency in 20 years, this is not working, okay, we can't, we can't trust ourselves or, or, you know, finance ministers anymore to, uh, to, to issue, you know, a sovereign currency, uh, you know, by default, a lot of these countries use the dollar, okay, as a primary reserve currency, but I, I, I don't think it's out of the uh, realm of possibilities that one of these countries is going to turn to Bitcoin, okay, and I think that that would be a very interesting phenomenon in the sense that the rest of the world would then have to accept it as a sovereign currency, right? Um, because it would be at that point, it would be the official currency of a country. Who knows what scenario might lead to that? And I'm not saying that that's going to be a necessary step. I think that Bitcoin just through you know dynamic market forces could start to operate as a currency. Um, and, and I do see that happening, you know, in the not too distant future. That's a really interesting scenario. I mean, I, I I have my doubts about whether that would happen in the next, uh, you know, 10, 20 years. But I mean, what what I'm curious though is if if transaction volumes uh, increase, and you know, in a couple of years we have uh, so next year actually we'll have the minor the minor reward go to half, and then tra- we can assume the transaction fees will start going up perhaps in four years after that, you know, as the minor rewards keep going down. If you have only these high value transactions with high minor fees that go into the Bitcoin blockchain and the blockchain is, the Bitcoin blockchain is only used as a clearing uh, mechanism, um, then where is the place for payments there? Where, I mean, how would you pay for, how would you uh, assume that Bitcoin could be used to pay for your newspaper or uh, coffee? Well, yeah, again, I think that there's, you know, a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, activity, okay, around uh, this, analyzing th- these potential future problems. Um, and I-, I like to make reference to, you know, Adam Smith's, uh, you know, invisible hand analogy, right? Where um, if, if, you know, the te- technology exists, if, if there's a, a need for a solution, someone is someone very intelligent is working on it at this moment, right? Either, you know, at MIT or, uh, you know, some private company. Um, and we and we can see evidence of that today already. Uh, you know, we can point to, for instance, a lightning network, okay? A, you know, a side chain, which is going to use uh, under its current kind of uh, iteration, uh, smart contracts, right? Where, you know, the nodes that uh, operate on, on the lightning network um, and it's basically it's designed to try to process a high volume of microtransactions to take the strain off of the blockchain itself. But it's using the blockchain, okay, to invo- enforce smart contracts for all the nodes operating on the Lightning Network. And there's teeth. You know, the the nodes are going to have pledged. You know, Bitcoin will be used as a common denominator and and, and frankly as as a kind of capital to enforce good behavior on the Lightning Network. So, um, and. It, it's it's more than just kind of a drawing board idea. I mean, it's something that is developed enough, and there's enough, you know, uh, kind of uh, activity behind it that you know there are solutions that you can see are are coming out of the ground, uh, which w- I think will will be effective in addressing some of these longer term issues. Um, but we are cognizant uh, of of you know the having of the reward, and as you say, the need to you know kind of for miners to start to to rely on transaction fees at some point in the distant future. But if this all operates as designed, you know, the Bitcoin, the value is going to continue to go up, right? As people use it more, the utility will increase. And, and as the only unit of, of, of value to be transacted on the Bitcoin network, the price of Bitcoin will go up. Yeah, uh, we, we did an episode with the Lightning Network guys a few weeks ago. So I think our listeners will, are well familiar with that. And, and I think I agree, you know, there are a lot of different ways that one can use either Bitcoin directly or Bitcoin as a sort of a clearing settlement thing and either one should work. And I guess 
we will see which direction it goes. I think it's not quite clear. Um, but I want to bring a, a sort of critical point up here that Tim Swanson and, and some other people have analyzed, uh, for example, some of the BitPay uh, data. And because they reuse addresses, so it's possible to estimate how much transaction volume they do. And also Coindesk, for example, they in their last uh, State of Bitcoin report, they showed like the, the number of new merchants that have uh, started accepting Bitcoin. And that has been decreasing dramatically. Um, What's your point of view there? Because it, it seems even though Bitcoin is becoming better known and more companies are building things that that sort of Bitcoin's usage as a payment system, people actually spending Bitcoins and new merchants as a consequence starting to accept Bitcoin, that's not happening at the moment. Why is that? And what can what needs to happen for that to change? Well, I, I, I can just say from, from our perspective, I, I've seen some of, the, some of the data you have and, and, and some of the blogs. Um, you know, we're in early days, right? And I think that uh, there's this saying, and I, I can't attribute it to the, to the author, but that, you know, we human beings tend to, you know, overestimate the value of innovation in the short term, but underestimate it uh, for the long term, Right. And, and I think that there was a big flurry of activity in the early days. You know, BitPay has been in business now, what, since 2011, I think, something like that. Um, uh, Coinbase uh, created a merchant processing service in, uh, what, January of 2014, right, when they kind of signed up Overstock. And they had exposed some APIs prior to that, right, to enable merchants to kind of create wallets and, and accept Bitcoin. Um, but I think that <clears throat> with, you know... With the introduction of a service like BitNet, right, where we really have approached it in, in, a, in a different way, where we've built a platform from the ground up with a lot of considerations in place to address, you know, some of the regulatory complexities, but but frankly, a lot of the technological um, hurdles that you know a PSP will want to see specific kind of services uh, or a large enterprise level, you know, international retailer. Uh, are, are going to want to see the ability to integrate into existing uh, commerce platforms, existing ERP systems that run their inventory and do reconciliation reporting. Um, before, I mean, not to blow our own horn, but before BitNet, a lot of these solutions didn't exist. So, right, if, if we're seeing, you know, a reluctance by some of the bigger retailers to accept Bitcoin, it could very well be that the state of the art to date was not sufficient. And, and we have gotten that feedback directly from a number of retailers who have said, yes, they want to take Bitcoin, but prior to meeting with BitNet and getting familiar with our systems, they weren't comfortable accepting Bitcoin, right? And so, you know, we'll see. It's, you know, I think that the idea is that we are continuing to focus on the acceptance side of the equation. Uh, we work very closely with a lot of the wallet companies and to try to keep, keep dialogues with the exchanges and try to figure out what solutions from, from wallet and other kind of consumer-facing enhancements may be necessary, okay, to motivate a consumer spend of Bitcoin as a payment type, whether it's, uh, you know, something the merchant can control, like a discount or a reward, right, the issuance of loyalty points for spending with Bitcoin, um, and instead of using a card or some other kind of payment, uh, perhaps that will help be helpful for motivating consumers to go out and get Bitcoin specifically, right, to, to make a payment. Um, we are, we are continuing to analyze the, 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 the spending patterns to the extent that we can try to extrapolate, you know, where's the Bitcoin going? We think that remittances are a big part of that. Uh, the remittances corridors are, I think, leading indicators of who is holding Bitcoin as a potential consumer and, you know, who will then uh, be in a position to spend Bitcoin uh, as, as payment, right? As opposed to, again, you know, speculative trading or, or a store of value. So uh, a lot of those signs point towards emerging markets, okay, uh, you know, South America, uh, Asia, where uh, expats, immigrants, are sending Bitcoin back to their friends and family. Um, we can see proliferation of ATMs. I think that's another a good indicator of where the Bitcoin activity is starting to happen, where recipients in these countries are getting Bitcoin uh, sent back from their family. Uh, and then they have the ability to go to an ATM and withdraw fiat currency to you know, spend locally 
and then leave the balance on the blockchain, right? As the, as their bank, um, and and frankly, you know, as we continue to uh, to launch retailers and and see where the spending comes from and tracking, you know, incoming IP addresses or or ship to addresses, um, that's you know trying to correlate those those trends and form a pattern. Uh, it does look like uh, probably a, a lot of the initial use case is enabling. Uh, re, uh, excuse me, enabling consumers and a lot of these developing emerging markets to spend on existing established retail sites. Okay. And so, but again, Brian, I mean, it's, let's face it, it's, it's still early days, right? In the sense of, if we look at the number of merchants that are accepting Bitcoin, you know, as a percentage of the number of, of retailers globally, it's a tiny rounding error type of, of, of fraction. Right. So we have a lot of work to do to solve the acceptance side to give people a place to spend Bitcoin. And there's a lot of hand wringing about, oh, people, you know, their consumers aren't spending. Well, where do they have to spend it? You know, look, I mean, we, we, I spent a lot of time talking about airlines. There are very few airlines right now. I think probably count them on one hand where you can actually go to their site and, and, and buy a ticket with Bitcoin. We're solving that. You know, we're integrating with the UATP, uh, Universal Air Travel Program, which is owned by the airlines. Okay, 260 airlines are, are now on, on the UATP network, uh, which, you know, we will now be able to seamlessly enable airlines to accept Bitcoin and settle those transactions through to existing systems. And I think that's an important notion to, to, to kind of uh, uh, drive home. Bitcoin is a silver bullet. As a front end payment type, it is a miracle. Okay, money over IP anywhere in the world to anywhere else in the world. But it doesn't change the existing payment infrastructure. It doesn't exi- change the back office systems, okay, that retailers have spent a lot of money putting in place. So I think that what BitNet is now solving for is the ability to use the miracle of, of Bitcoin as money over IP, but at the same time, interface with all the existing payment infrastructure, the plumbing, as we like to call it, which is a labyrinth of complicated commerce platforms and, and, and checkout systems and modules. And so the point being that that system is not going to change overnight just because they now have the ability to accept payments from anywhere in the world. And, and that's, that's not something that a, a company is going to jump into this industry without having been at CyberSource, for instance, for the last 15 years and figured all this stuff out and provide, provide the solutions that the big global retailers and airlines are going to want to see as a, as a precursor to accepting Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I think if we if you think of the sort of you know you mentioned Adam Smith and and if one thinks of where should it end up in terms of an efficient market an efficient system, then it's pretty clear to me. I, I completely agree that in the long run, uh, something like Bitcoin just makes a lot of sense. Um, one of my biggest worries and my biggest concerns is actually the security of the Bitcoin network with mining, mining centralization, and, and the incentives for miners. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is that something you worry about as well? Well, certainly. We've got some people on staff that uh, uh, one guy in particular likes to terrorize me with uh, conspiracy theories, right, about uh, you know, big mining pools going offline periodically and who the hell knows what they're up to. And, you know, um, and, and I do think that it's, it's, it's a legitimate risk that we all need to remain, you know, uh, watchful and cognizant about, um, you know, at the same time, it seems like there's enough self-governance kind of in play. And, and you know, when, when the mining uh, power gets too, too concentrated, there seem to be some concessions to, to make everyone comfortable again. And, and I think ultimately that, you know, it, it's in the doomsday scenario, if, if someone's going to try to, to, to take over and corrupt the, the, you know, the Bitcoin network, what are they, what are they going to gain? You know, they're going to destroy the value, right, of, of what they're trying to obtain. Well, if you can short Bitcoin, which presumably in a, in a world where Bitcoin's integrated, you will be able to, there's ETFs and all those things, well, then there's potentially a lot to gain. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess you're right. I mean, there's, there's probably with, with derivatives and, and other kinds of financial instruments, there's always a way to, to benefit from destroying something. Um, you know, the so-called bear raid, right, from the, from the stock trading strategy where you short something right. and make up a bunch of bad rumors about it, <laughs> and, you know. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I, you know, I, I got to say that the, the, while the, 
the mining business is important clearly because that's they maintain the nodes that uh, that comprise the Bitcoin network, and that's of vital importance to a company like like Bitnet or anybody else using using Bitcoin. Um, the economics, I gotta say, I mean, we we talk to a lot of private equity firms and other types of investors who always like to ask us questions about what we think about this mining company or that mining firm, and and I gotta say, I mean, that's that's just high stakes gambling, right? It's 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 an arms race where you know it, it's you know it's tied to a lot of you know, electricity and, and other other costs. Where um, I'm sure somebody can figure that out, and if it, you know, legitimate businesses are, are based on on mining, and, and that's great. But um, I can't profess, frankly, to be you know an expert. I mean, that is uh, the big Bitcoin ecosystem. I'll just admit that is the one place where I've got a big blind spot. Like I just, you know, there's nothing. You know, we have not spent any time actually looking at mining as a business, uh, except except from just you know. Third hand, what what you can read in the papers. Okay, I mean, I, I can again, I can talk to some people at mining firms, and I know some some mining firms that have pivoted, you know, and gotten out of mining altogether, and just cut over to big data, right? Because of some of the costs, and because you know the reward did not keep pace, you know, with with the, the initial business plan, right? Or even look at a big kind of you know example like Twenty One, right? That has continued to to sort of pivot, right? From um, you know, a, a mining strategy to now a consumer facing strategy, so far as we can see from again reading in the papers. Um, so, uh, but anyway, going back to your, your initial question, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the risk, right, of, of, you know, the, the, the miners or some nefarious activity uh, from the mining side, you know, corrupting and, and, and destroying the value of the network. It, it's something to be mindful of, uh, certainly. Um, and we've got some folks on staff that, again, are, are you know, hyper, hyper focused on tracking kind of concentration of mining power and, and periodically terrorizing me with some of the stats. <laughs> but uh, it's not something that keeps me awake at night at this point. Today's magic word is pristine, P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Let's talk about Bitnet. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious. Can you tell us about uh, the infrastructure that you're building, some of the services that you provide? I believe you have an API as well. Talk to us about the products you're building. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the idea was that uh, we we have a, a suite of services that are accessible through uh, a, a a single API connection, a, a RESTful hypermedia API that uh, is easy to integrate. We've got an implementation guide available on our website that anyone can download. We've got a test center, which is important. Um, and uh, we basically accept the Bitcoin on behalf of the retailer. So the retailer does not have to uh, manage the handling of the Bitcoin. Uh, we maintain the trading accounts at exchanges so that we can aggregate and periodically sweep the Bitcoin over a period of say 10, 15 minutes into a trading account and liquidate it. Uh, we have some hedging strategies that at this point aren't too complicated, but um, you know, we have the ability through some, uh, as Brian just mentioned, there are some, some outfits in New York coming up with derivative products and forward contracts and other kinds of uh, hedging uh, services. But at this point, it's really, it's straightforward for, for, from our standpoint. Uh, we just try to trade as quickly as possible. Uh, we have Bitcoin on reserve you know, at exchanges so we can lock in the trade. But the net result is that we guarantee the payout um, in fiat currency to the retailer at the transaction value, uh, net, uh, net of our processing fee. And um, the, you know, it, it's a pretty simple, you know, it's a pretty straightforward value prop, especially as compared to you know, the cost of other uh, cards and other kind of payment types as we discussed earlier. Um, so from a retailer perspective, uh, they integrate to our platform either directly or through their PSP or commerce platform or other sort of intermediary, um, we take it from there, right? We handle the, the Bitcoin, the conversion, and the payout to their account in their currency of choice at a guaranteed rate. Uh, I will say that there's there's one enhancement probably worthy of noting um, that we, we've started to, to discuss publicly just recently, and it's a um, uh, it's a, a risk a proprietary risk mitigation tool. Uh, I believe we're we're calling it uh, instant authorization. Okay, where uh, 
despite the lag time, as we are, are all aware of, of the confirmation system, um, anywhere from you know five to ten plus minutes to, to confirm a transaction, um, we're able to monitor the Bitcoin network and uh, come up with in, in a few hundred milliseconds uh, a risk score uh, that is reliable enough to us that we can you know we're capable of making a determination you know in, in that few second time frame to underwrite a transaction okay and so and that that's a big part of our guarantee to the merchant of the payout uh in the sense of if it's a digital good or an immediate download uh you know something that has to be approved instantaneously um uh from from the retailer perspective we can do that okay so that's again just kind of a uh, a proprietary value-added component of, of the service, of the suite of services that uh, retailers are able to access through, through our API integration to our platform. And so the, the customers you're targeting, you're, you mentioned you were targeting PSPs. Uh, are you also providing services just for merchants, like just like the mom and pop store that has an e-commerce boutique? Or are you mostly uh, targeting like larger merchants uh, with... Uh, uh, really integrated Bitcoin payments, like on their website, etc. Yeah, well, well, both. Okay, so I think that the uh, the larger merchants um, we can integrate directly uh, for the for the smaller, as you say, mom and pop, you know, SMB, small, medium business size businesses. Um, we typically will work through aggregators. Okay, so that would be say a shopping cart provider or a payment service provider or, or a commerce platform. Okay, and examples of those would be sort of uh, well, the bigger ones, SAP, Oracle, IBM, but also, uh, you know, Hybris, uh, uh, NetSuite, Magento. Uh, a lot of these companies that provide software uh, or SaaS-based, you know, commerce platforms to enable merchants. You know, so in other words, retailers will outsource a lot of their payment infrastructure to a variety of these types of partners. And depending on the vertical and frankly, the size of the merchant, Okay, and the complexity of what the merchant is selling, you know, inventory control, you know, tax collections, all this kind of stuff, they typically turn, you know, to, to, to a partner for that. I mean, retailers, you know, they're 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 not they don't want to be in the IT business. They want to outsource that. And and so yeah. what what we do and what we have done is uh, to design and launch a platform that can integrate through a series of of what we call microservices. So we have discrete APIs from a platform to platform integration that can interconnect with these specific functional areas uh, of these commerce platforms, of these PSPs, um, to pass through the data that uh, the merchants are gonna need to complete these transactions. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. And I mean, I, I, I guess that's a way for you to, um, with one partnership with, you know, like a, Go, a Magento Go or a, a PSP to uh, potentially reach a really large number of merchants and customers uh, rather than trying to target like individual merchants that are setting up Presta Shop or Magento on their own servers and, and you know having modules and having to deal with customer service with them. Um, having that higher level strategy where you're going after large payment processors and large e-commerce uh, SaaS solutions uh, does sort of broaden your reach. Yeah, no, exactly. That's it, Sebastian. I mean, that's that's precisely the strategy is to be this a trusted solution partner uh, to to uh, you know, to provide Bitcoin acceptance through these existing well we, if we would call you know alliance partnerships okay but, but frankly they're they're distribution channels right uh, for us to to leverage the installed base of merchants that uh, have been aggregated by these uh, payment solution providers. So before we wrap up, one last topic that we've also been coming back to again and again, uh, which is the regulation side. So Bit License now finally came out, um, and the I think the aspect that may be most interesting there is is the sort of KYC requirements, as I take them, where at least at some point it said that you know if if you're um, doing a Bitcoin transaction, you have to know you know both parties. What does that mean for you? Are you guys gonna get a bit licensed? Do you need to? Uh, and will you at some point need to do KYC on on each payment you receive or process? Well, yeah. I mean, our our approach, frankly, to to regu regulatory discussions has been, you know, we 
to the extent that we can technologically comply with the regulation, in general, we're in favor of regulation, right? We're in favor of the comfort level that banks get from dealing with regulated entities okay and that's a you know as we all know that's the biggest you know hurdle the biggest stumbling block to this industry is is getting bank relationships if if you need it if you need one right and there there are certain types of businesses that aren't going to have to deal with banks so they can continue to you know ignore that consideration but for us that's a critical dependency right is the interconnection to banks to settle merchant funds through to their accounts um, and so that being said, you know, New York is, it's a key jurisdiction, right? It's an important market. Uh, a lot of retailers based in New York, a lot of consumers based in New York. Um, so I know that there's a lot of discussion about, you know, ring fencing New York, right? And, you know, using IP addresses to just block uh, New York. And I, I know some, some companies have already come out and said they're going to do exactly that. Um, you know, we filed a comment letter to BitLicense. Uh, we asked for the same uh, exemption, okay, as a merchant processor, that uh, that applies for their the their money transmission statute in New York, where there's a so-called uh, processor exemption that if you're an agent on behalf of a merchant, that you are exempt from having to obtain a money transmission license in the state of New York because in effect all you're doing is collecting on an invoice on behalf of a merchant. Um, so bit license unfortunately does not contain that same exemption as we had requested. Um, so we are going to be required as a condition to doing business in New York to obtain a bit license. Uh, it's just, it, it's become final. We're analyzing it. We're trying to figure out exactly uh, uh, how to comply with it. Uh, fortunately, we, we have the tools to do so. Okay, we have the ability to collect pair information um, through, through an API uh, on our platform. Um, so you know, technologically, we can comply with bit license. Okay, but we're only going to be able to do it to the extent that the merchant uh, we don't have the relationship with the consumer. We are an agent on behalf of the merchant. So the merchant is going to have to collect the payer information or sufficient information uh, that you know, can be passed through to us as their processor uh, to comply to comply with the bit license. And that's our current understanding. But that's a, that's a super crucial point you're bringing up here, right? Because one of the appeals, and then I've talked about this in, in talks about Bitcoin as well, you know, why is Bitcoin so much better than like credit card and stuff? Well, if you pay online, you don't have to fill out, you know, your address and your name and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, of course, sometimes you need to do that anyway if you get a product shipped or something like that. But often, and especially if you think of like one-off small payments and stuff, you just want to get rid of that. And with Bitcoin, because it's sort of like cash, you can. But what you're saying is that, well, if, if any in any way you're sort of touched by this bit of license thing, so for example, you guys wouldn't be able to offer that service. Well, that's right. I mean, and, and again, we're, you know, we're analyzing it. It, it didn't come out as any huge surprise, right? The, the previous iterations had been available for public comment. So we're pretty familiar with what was finally signed into law. Um, but, you know, you raise a good point for, you know, something that where physical good has to be shipped. Clearly, a lot of that information is being collected by the merchant anyway. Um, so, and again, it's going to be up to the merchant from our point of view. If the merchant says, you know what, I'm just trying to sell, you know, an MP3 file. And, and part of the appeal of Bitcoin is that someone can scan a QR code and go on their way. I'm not going to collect payer information. Then our response to that merchant is going to be, well, then you can't accept Bitcoin from consumers in New York. And we're going to have to figure out how to make sure that you don't, right? And as a processor, right, we're going to be the ones responsible for, for enforcing the bit license. Um, it's not optimal. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, right? I mean, I think that uh, you know, I think that the 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 sort of outcry from some of the other constituents in the Bitcoin ecosystem to let's ring fence New York and shut them off, um, you know, that's not going to change the law. Now, it, it may draw attention to the fact that in other jurisdictions that are contemplating you know similar licenses as California now is, as New Jersey now is, um, you know, the the reaction. From the Bitcoin ecosystem to Bit License may have some influence over you know their their design, okay, their drafting of regulation, which does not contain uh, the same level of uh, uh, you know information or the, you know that, that does not introduce the same a level of friction, right, for using Bitcoin. Um, but it it is what it is, right. And I think that at this point, our position is we're going to do our best to comply with it, right, because you know 
We want our merchants to accept Bitcoin wherever our merchants want to accept Bitcoin. If that includes New York, we'll figure it out. Okay, but uh, it could very well get to a place where technologically, and that's that's our our fallback position. You know, our mantra is if we can technologically comply with this regulation, we fully intend to. But if we can't, then we won't. <laughs> right? And and unfortunately, then we'll by default fall into the category of some of these other companies that are already out front saying we're not going to do business in New York, and neither should you. Cool. Well, um, John, thanks so much for coming on. It was really interesting talking with you. It was really interesting diving a little bit deeper into sort of one of the primary use cases of Bitcoin. Yeah, I appreciate that, Brian. Yeah, I really do. Look forward to uh, seeing you next week in Berlin. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, John is coming over because the Tech Open Air is coming up here, actually, to anyone who is in Berlin. Uh, so Tech Open Air is coming up. There will be a few events. It's just a panel that I'm moderating with John and, and Mike Hearn is going to come over. And we'll also be showing uh, uh, screaming of the documentary, uh, Bitcoin, the end of money as we know it. Right. Uh, some of you have probably seen the trailer, and I think it's going to be quite excellent. There's a good um, chance this probably airs after, uh, after that. Oh, event. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as, yeah, so thanks so much for joining us to our listeners. So we put out new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, favorite podcast app, and you can also get the video on YouTube uh, at epicenter, youtube.com slash epicenter BTC. And you know, if you like the show, you've listened, been listening to it for a while, you can do us a favor and uh, leave us an iTunes review. That would be appreciated. And it helps other people uh, find the show. And of course, you can send us a tip if you want to to our address. So thanks so much. And until next time.